Welcome to Serve News. So without uh, further ado, I am going point to... Point of order. Uh, I have a, a point of order uh, from... Point of, point of order. Okay, so I've got Mr. <coughs> Green on a point of order, and then I've got uh, Mr. Villemure on points of orders before, before we begin. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Green. On the point of order, you referenced a, a motion. I would ask that you read that motion, reread that motion pertaining to uh, today's meeting. Can um, and I'm just going to uh, I'm just going to get the uh, clerk to uh, to read the motion. Uh, Mr. Green, stand by. Motion once she pulls it up. Uh, the motion adopted as amended reads that in light of the February 28, 2024 tabling of the Winnipeg lab documents, which contain the government's own findings, uh, concluding that the People's Republic of China and its entities infiltrated Canada's top microbiology lab, a national security breach representing a very serious and credible threat to Canada, and given that access to this information has been denied to Parliament and all Canadians by the government for several years, the committee undertake a study for three meetings pursuant to Standing Orders 10H3H and 6 and 7 of the government's reasons to deny access to it by Parliament and Canadians, provided that the committee report its findings to the House and the request pursuant to Standing Order 109 a comprehensive response from the government and call the following witnesses to appear for one hour per witness. Anthony Rhoda, former Speaker of the House of Commons. Philip Dufresne, former law clerk of the Parliamentary Council of the House of Commons. Ian Stewart, former President of the Public Health Agency of Canada. The Minister of Health, the Honourable Mark Holland. The Minister of Public Safety, Democratic Institutions and Intergovernmental Affairs the Honourable Dominic LeBlanc, <clears throat> and any other witnesses that the committee deems necessary. Now, before I, I go back to you on that, uh, Mr. Green, um, I, just, I just want to inform the committee that uh, when I was dealing with the office and the clerk was dealing with the office of the law clerk, uh, they are the ones that suggested that we invite Michelle Bedard and not Philip. Michelle uh, was already working for the office of the law clerk <coughs> and probably have better answers in the event uh, that the committee is not satisfied with the meeting today, then Mr. Dufresne can still be invited. Uh, I did invite the Information Commissioner, Canada's Information Commissioner, uh, as, uh, as a chair prerogative. We have three hours today. Uh, from, May from May 17th to June 10th, unfortunately, the Commissioner will be out of the country. So I thought uh, that it would be a good idea to have Canada's Information Commissioner here at least to fill in one hour. Um, I know that the invitation talked about Mr. Stewart, who's the President of the Public Health Agency of Canada. He's no longer in that position, as committee members are aware, and so we can only invite him if we find him. Uh, and uh, we're, we're working on that. Anthony Rhoda and the two ministers have been invited to the committee, and we are waiting for confirmations on potential dates and uh, as you know, as members of the committee know, booking ministers usually results in a lot of back and forth. So um, that being said, two out of the three uh, witnesses that have been asked by the committee with respect to the departments that they serve, uh, including the President of the Public Health Agency today, is, is going to be appearing with us in the third hour, uh, the office of the law clerk uh, has sent uh, uh, Mr. Michelle Bedard is here uh, to address the committee's concerns. I'm going to remind the committee too that the motion that was passed uh, called for up to three meetings. Uh, this is meeting number. Mr. One. Chair, yeah, I just, haven't I haven't stated I haven't stated any of my point of order. I simply that's asked okay. You I'm just explaining to read that. I'm just explaining yeah, where I, we're at, Mr. Green. Uh, from my perspective as chair, as to the reasons and rationale. Uh, where we're at. So if you let me finish, I'll get to your point of order. The uh, third, the other point, the last point that I'll make is that we have up to three meetings uh, with respect to the Winnipeg Lab issue. As I mentioned, we did invite the ministers uh, to come as well as Mr. Rhoda. Uh, so we are going to be able to, I suspect and hope, to fill those meetings. But um, I just wanted to provide clarity to the, uh, the committee as to 
where we're at today and the witnesses that are appearing before us and the rationale as well. So go ahead, Mr. Green, with your point of order, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, I find your actions rather unusual in unilaterally taking what you have determined to be the chair's prerogative when indeed it is the custom the masters of their own domain, uh, you, sir, are simply there to chair the processes and, and procedures within the course of uh, the due planning. The planning has to come from the direction of the committee, sir. You have unilaterally taken this opportunity to call a meeting without any consideration to the other parties involved. You'll recall in a motion of our first meeting, uh, I believe it was dated um, December 13th, 2021, that you were enacted under the under the accorded uh, standing orders to hold meetings and uh, moved by Ms. Hefner, who's, who's back with us today, that you be authorized to hold meetings and to receive evidence and to have it published when a quorum is not present. Now, hold meetings and calling meetings, uh, it has been my experience uh, within my time on the House uh, side here that there are subcommittees that plan the work and I think what I'm particularly agitated by is the fact that even within the course of this term you'll reflect back on times in which members have used 106s to have an emergency meeting. I feel that it is your uh, actions today uh, have been used to surreptitiously avoid having to negotiate with any of the other parties present to call a meeting uh, down the final stretch, uh, and I should note for the record, for the media who's watching and everybody else, that every single conservative-led committee is doing the same thing without the ability to have what I Point think is order, a common chair. courtesy, uh, to have the common courtesy Point of, order, of a planning committee. Hold on now, now. On, my plan on my point of order, uh, Mr. Chair, you'll note that the standing orders uh, order, require order from the same order. day, dated December 13th, that they require yeah, having an in-camera meeting that allows the witnesses to be determined prior to the commencement of a study. You've not done that. You've effectively blocked out the Bloc, the Liberals, and the NDP from determining the course of action of this study without any conversation or consideration for scheduling. I find that to be uh, an authoritarian use of your position and highly problematic. Okay, thank you uh, for that, Mr. Green. I did, uh, I did explain uh, earlier uh, where we were at with respect to the witnesses. I will reiterate that we have two more meetings that we can call and invitations have been sent uh, I took it upon myself to ask Ms. Menard to be here, knowing that she was going to be out of the country until June 10th. We had an extra hour today to deal with her, and I thought uh, Ms. Menard added uh, to the discussion. So uh, that's my It's rationale. not your position to take, to take these types of liberties, the, the other to decide thing, on behalf the, of the committee thank you, who Mr. and when the we other meet. Thing, the other thing that I will say is that, uh, and you'll recall or may, may not recall, that on May 7th, I indicated to the committee that I'd asked for deviation time because we uh, were running out of time very, very quickly. And I sent you an email, I sent all members, including the vice chairs, and Mr. Vilmir was included, and you were as well, indicating- that, That's not factual, sir. Deviation in time means extended time. Not once did you ever bring in your testimony. You can reflect on the Hansard uh, meeting in the course of our constituency weeks, where all of us, I'm sure, had very busy schedules, uh, had commitments that were in our communities, and you arbitrarily took your power as the chair to circumvent any kind of committee discussion in a way that I think is an abuse of your well, power, sir. Point of order, chair. Absolute yep. abuse on, of Mr. your Mr. power. Mr. Kirk, and and it, turns it, it turns committees like this into absolute chaos when there isn't a modicum of decorum well, and when there isn't a modicum of courtesy to be paid on the outset of these studies. You do not have the power, sir. This isn't a point of order. Um, you now, do not have the power. Green, it is. It's we're, a scheduling we're, question. Okay, so of course I, it's a point I've of order. I've got your point. I appreciate it's absolutely your point. a point of order. I appreciate your point, Mr. Green. I'm going to move on because I've got Mr. Vilmure on a point of order. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Vilmure. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. There's something that I find interesting. We planned for three meetings. This is the first. During the first meeting, the witnesses that we have are not on the witness list that we had originally, and I find that concerning because 
and I love hearing from Miss Maynard, but I'm concerned that we won't be able to meet the deadlines that we've set for ourselves. I know that Miss Jeffrey is replacing Mr. Stewart, but we had asked for Mr. Stewart. Same thing for Mr. Dufresne. So I'm wondering, the committee's motion was clear. We want to talk about the reasons why the government refused access to members on the Winnipeg Lab documents. Miss Jeffrey was not there at the time, and neither was the other witness. And so I'm concerned to see that the heart of the motion that we won't be receiving the witnesses that we had set out originally. Merci, uh, Monsieur. Thank you, Monsieur Villemur. I have already explained how we arrived in this position. We invited other witnesses to this committee. In progress right now, Mr. Vilmir. So we are we are going to, with the meetings that we do have scheduled, to attempt to get the uh, witnesses uh, here, including the ministers whose invitations have already been sent out. Uh, I am. Um, I mean, we're. I'd like to go to Miss Maynard, uh, but I I do have. Uh, is it on a point of order, uh, Larry? Are you still up on a point of order because you had your hand up? My point of order was articulated by Mr. Barrett. Thank okay. You. Thank you so much. Uh, and then, uh, Ms. B Ms. Hepner, on, do you have a point of order? <clears throat> yes, uh, just to support my colleague Matthew Green's point of order, I thought everything he said was completely in line. I find this, uh, the way that this committee has been called, completely bizarre. I don't find that the uh, rationale is there from what you've just uh, described to us. Mr. Chair, it's not okay. like this study is okay. actually... Lisa, we're getting it. We're getting into debate here. It's been here, studied so at another committee, but so uh, Matthew's absolutely right, <clears throat> and I want to echo his outrage. This right. should not be happening. You should in, not be able to debate. circumvent. Well, okay, point Mr. Of order. Chair. Thank, Mr. Thank Chair, you. my hands up next. Um, um, on Mr. A, Chair, on a point of you've order. You've made a decision. Yeah. You've made a decision. I'm now challenging the chair. Okay. And and what are you challenging the chair on, uh, Mr. Green? Just so that I'm clear. On your ability to arbitrarily set the course of this committee okay. without consulting with us on the Just witness hang on list. A sec. We're still on a point of order, Mr. Green. So uh, you said you made a decision, and so now I'm challenging your decision. Just hang on a sec, uh, Mr. Green. So, Mr. Mr. Green, uh, you can challenge me all you want. Um, the authority that I have as a chair to call a meeting, uh, which I've done and I've given my reasons for, um, cannot be challenged. There is nothing to challenge. Um, so, you know, I'll leave it to you. Uh, if you want to uh, have a procedural uh, motion a, a little bit later on or a dilatory, that's, that's perfectly your right. But there is effectively nothing to challenge at this point. Because I've called the meeting, the meeting is going to proceed uh, unless there are other points of orders, and I am going to get Ms. Menard to speak to the committee and to uh, start the process of having a meeting today. So uh, I do see uh, Ms. Khalid has her hand up, and I, I, on a point of order, Ms. Khalid, I see your head nodding, so it's on a point of order. Go ahead, please. Chair, uh, Chair thanks, I believe I had, Chair. had asked for a point of order oh, before Ms. Khalid. I'm going to, uh, Mr. Couric did, uh, did say yes. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Couric, and then I'll come to you on a point of order. Go ahead, Mr. Couric. Thanks, Chair. And just, just to reiterate the fact that we're now 21 minutes into a meeting when we should be hearing okay, I don't from the get, Commissioner, so let's get to work. I don't want to get into debate. Uh, on a point of order, Ms. Khalid, go ahead. On a point of order, no debate. Go ahead. Uh, absolutely, Chair. I, and again, like uh, just to to give my two cents on on what your ruling and your statement has been uh, on the point of order raised by uh, by Mr. Green. I believe that the the uh, intent and the spirit of the motion that we had originally passed on this specific issue has not been 
kept with what is uh, what is uh, ensued here in uh, in today's meeting, and I just want to register uh, that uh, that you have not done right by by what this committee uh, has been trying to do over these past number of uh, of weeks and months on this specific issue. And okay, I, I would really encourage you, Chair, to debate, to really uh, take into account what uh, what our committee members have yeah. to say. Yeah, I appreciate that, and uh, I feel that I am acting uh, within my authority as chair. I appreciate that. Uh, we do have, as I said earlier, two more meetings, two more meetings. Two of the witnesses that are here today are representing agencies that are, that are part of that motion. Um, we will uh, work towards getting everybody within those two meetings to appear before this committee. So, Ms. Menard, I appreciate that you've been waiting patiently, and I do appreciate the fact that you are here today to provide uh, testimony to this committee in relation to the study as it relates to the Winnipeg Lab. Uh, you have the floor. You have five minutes to address the committee. Go ahead, Ms. Menard. Thank you. Merci. Alors, je suis heureuse de comparer le comité. Thank you. I'm pleased to appear before this committee for the second time this spring. It's only been a few weeks since I last spoke to you, but much has happened since then. Before answering questions related to your committee study, I would like to take this opportunity to give you a quick update regarding my office's operations. I tabled a special report on my systemic investigation into access to immigration-related information. Three years after my investigation into the dramatic increase in access to information requests at Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, IRCC, requesters continue to use the access system to get information on their immigration files for a lack of better alternative. This is now also impacting the Canada Border Services Agency, which has access to the same data and which is now experiencing its own increase in requests. This investigation allowed us to determine that the root cause for the problem was the lack of progress by, made by the RRCC in implementing a portal to provide the information their clients are seeking. I hope you will take the opportunity to read this report if, I, if you have not already done so. As I mentioned when I last appeared before this committee a month ago, in addition to not receiving any additional temporary funding as requested, I am now facing a structural deficit. This deficit results from rigid formulas the Treasury Board Secretariat used to calculate funding for new collective agreement salary increases. over the past few weeks, we are now looking at a total funding shortfall of $700,000, which represents a reduction in my budget of approximately 5%. In concrete terms, this will represent a significant portion of my overall IT budget or money to cover the cost of defending my orders in court or funding for a full team of investigators. Basically, this reduction in my budget will spell longer delays for complainants who are seeking information for government, from government institutions. This state of affairs will not arise if my office were subject to a different funding model that was more agile, more flexible, and more reflective of my independence as an agent of parliament. Earlier this week, I sent a letter to the acting Treasury Board Secretary to seek immediate redress of this unacceptable predicament, and it is my intention to keep this committee informed as things evolve. My office has again made significant progress this year against our inventory of complaints, but more remains to be done. We need to continue to work through these complaints in order to avoid increasing our backlog. I also have multiple court cases in ma to manage as a result of orders that I have issued against government institution. Now is not the time for bureaucratic penny pinching. Let's now turn to the topic of the day. As you know, the Access to Information Act provides that anyone in Canada, including members of Parliament, has the right to make an access to information request for records under the control of government institution. If you are not satisfied with that response, you have the right to make a complaint to my office. I can confirm that the topic covered by your study has indeed been the subject of access to information requests and complaints to my office. I can also confirm that I have investigated many of these complaints and that some of those investigations are still ongoing. 
en ce qui concerne le processus parlementaire. Regarding the parliamentary process by which members of parliament may also seek information from institutions, this is entirely separate and distinct from the process of making an access to information request. The law clerk and parliamentary counsel of the House of Commons will be in a better position to speak to the specifics of that process during his appearance. I would now be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Okay, merci, uh, Madame Maynard. Uh... Thank you, Ms. Maynard. We're going to start with our first round of questions, six minutes each. We're going to start with Mr. Barrett. Mr. Bernard, nice to see you. Have you followed the treatment of the Winnipeg Lab documents over the last several years and the lengths that the Trudeau government has gone to to keep them uh, behind closed doors? And is it your assessment that this treatment follows the usual pattern that this government has undertaken in uh, dealing with uh, information. I cannot comment on the process uh, by which you requested those uh, documents and the delays, but I can tell you that under the access to information regime, clearly we've been seeing increases in timelines to respond to access requests. So through the regular course of uh, individuals uh, and parliamentarians uh, attempting to use the access to information system to access information, um, the government has, uh, you have, had to take the government to court. Is that correct? In some cases, yes. In this case, we have uh, the full um, House of Commons issuing orders for the production of documents uh, and the government uh, using judicial means to try and, and block the release of those documents. So the question is, is that consistent with your experience? Again, I don't know what are being used as, as ex or reasons to not provide the information to parliamentary requests uh, under the privilege of parliament. But under the Access to Information Act, we see the use of different exemptions. And also, we've, we're seeing uh, delays in responding to access requests whether it's related to this particular topic or other topics, we, we know that the, the system is overwhelmed right now. The government has claimed, the Trudeau government has claimed that they're open by default. That was a promise uh, on, on them taking office. Is your experience that this government is open by default? My experience is that there's a lot more that can be done with respect to transparency. How many complaints around access to information or the management have, uh, of files um, has your office received? According to, I'm sorry, about what topic? On, on this, well, first generally, and then on this, on this specific topic of these documents. With respect to your study, we've received 14 complaints. Four, and, go ahead. <laughs> but with respect to ma the management of uh, so far, with respect to all of complaints that we receive, over 4,000 complaints uh, in the last year. So, in one case, there was an ATIP filed for information regarding the management um, of these files, and one department, uh, the Department of Justice, said that they have the information that they could have the information. They would release the information in 13 years. Is that acceptable? can't comment about that, a specific complaints that we would be investigating at my office right now. Is a delay of 13 years, hypothetically speaking, an acceptable amount of time for the government in responding to an access to information request? I can tell you that I've seen cases where uh, extensions have been found reasonable uh, because of the amount of documents that people are asking. But I don't know about the specific uh, cases. It's a really, it's, it's a case by case basis. On how many occasions have you found uh, yourself, on uh, acting on behalf of your office, uh, in court uh, with the federal government? How many, how many times? My, uh, I think right now we have 11 cases that are active. 11 active? Do you know how many you've had since you've taken, uh, taken your office? No, your, but your I can post come back to you with the information. But pardon me? I can, I can get that information for you. Is it your belief that Canadians have a quasi-constitutional right to access information and that the government has a legal obligation to provide that information? The Supreme Court has recognized that the right of access is a quasi-constitutional right 
And yes, the government information belongs to Canadians. So w unless there's limitation, exemptions, exclusions, that information should be provided to Canadian. So we have a situation here where your office has multi multiple uh, uh, complaints. Um, we know that uh, there were orders of um, lawful orders of committee, lawful orders of the House of Commons, and that the uh, Trudeau government um, refused those lawful orders. So can we uh, infer from that that the government did break that quasi-constitutional right that Canadians have when their elected representatives are even being refused information that they have lawful authority to order? I've seen cases where the information should have been provided and other cases where the information was properly redacted. It really, again, is, it depends on the cases. Is it your experience, Commissioner, that access to information is a priority of the Trudeau government? At this point, I don't see it as a priority. We are asking for uh, legislative changes. We are asking for changes within the system. And uh, there's, there hasn't been a lot of uh, improvement. Yeah, well, well I, I would just say in, in closing, Commissioner, I appreciate the work that you do. It, uh, um, Canadians um, share in your frustration, having had their elected representatives order the government on more than one occasion to produce this information and the government illegally refusing that, that lawful order of Parliament. Um, we, we share your frustration and, uh, and work to get answers, uh, as, as do you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Barrett. Uh, next six-minute intervention. I'm not sure who we're going to go to. Uh, cause it's, we uh, it's me, Mr. Chair. Mr. Fisher, go ahead, sir. Go. Six minutes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do have to chime in. I didn't do a point of order, but I have to chime in. I'm, I'm certainly joining the others that are disappointed in this meeting being called uh, with little notice and at, totally at the discretion of the chair. And during a very rare constituency week when all of our schedules were completely full, jam-packed, and when we should be spending this last week before the summer break engaging with our constituents. Um, all this to start a study that we could easily start in Ottawa. The committee agreed to study this, uh, even though it's already been studied at Canada-China Committee. And in fact, it's just wrapped up. Why today and why during a constituency week? So I share those frustrations. Now, I've seen uh, meetings called during non-sitting weeks before. Sure, uh, 1064s happen all the time. Uh, emergency meetings, you know, for current topics that just can't wait but this this study today is based on something that happened in 2020 and was just studied by another committee and mr chair we're committing to studying it as well so my personal opinion is more pressing might be the recent news story on conservatives spending over four hundred thousand dollars in taxpayer money during their political conventions Maybe that's the emergency that we should be talking about today. Maybe we should be seeking an NS, Point of order, NMS consent today Point of order. to have a, a study on Hang that. Hang on, Mr. Um, uh, Fisher. We have a uh, point of order from Mr. Brock. I did stop your time. Pur purpose of, you. uh, of this committee and all committees that I have the privilege of uh, sitting on is not an open license. It's just to go about and rant and express your frustration. Does he actually have a question? Does he actually that's want a wild, to utilize That's a wild statement coming so, from you, Larry. So, Mr. Uh, Mr. Are, are you being serious right Point now? Point of order. We, uh, yes, Ms. Khalid, I am being we, serious. Uh, listen, we're going to stop. We're going to stop. Listen, I, I, I would encourage you to, to also Khalid, do the same. Through the chair, please. So, Mr. Brock, I appreciate your point of order. As you know, uh, we I do give a lot of latitude on this committee for discussion. I expect that Mr. Fisher is going to bring it back to the uh, relevant uh, topic at hand, um, as I expect all members to. So, and I'm just going to uh, I'm just going to stop everybody right here. That I don't, uh, you know, we talked about the issue with the interpreters earlier. When everybody is screaming over Zoom, that doesn't help to prevent the injury to the interpreters. So I'm going to ask, if not uh, any respect at all, at least have some for the interpreters because I will uh, work with audio to uh, cut off members to avoid injury to the interpreters. So, Mr. Fisher, you have four minutes and 43 seconds. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, what, I, what I would say, though, this isn't how a well-functioning committee should work. Uh, you've told members in the past that you would consult and you'd discuss with them before doing things like this and moving in this direction. So, Mr. Chair, I would strongly and respectfully suggest that you find some time on Tuesday to allow the committee to... Uh, 
come up with and decide on a work plan for the rest of the year. I think that would be something that would be very beneficial for us. And for those reasons and more, I move that the meeting now be adjourned. Uh, team cover up. Here cover they come. Up. He moved to adjourn. Oh. Moved, he moved to cover up the, so, thank the you, failure Mr. to release That's the Winnipeg enough. Lab documents. So uh, Mr. Fisher has uh, moved to adjourn the meeting. And uh, by, his, uh, by his request, he's asked that this meeting not continue, in spite of the fact that we have witnesses here. Uh, so I, uh, it's a uh, non- Chair, I don't think that a, uh, I'm explaining uh, that a again, commentary on your part is, I'm explaining is appropriate, again, Chair. I'm explaining again, Ms. Khalid. We, did this, we went through this last time this happened. For those who are watching, Mr. Fisher has moved to adjourn this meeting to stop the meeting from proceeding. It is a dilatory motion, which means that it is non-debatable. And so I have an obligation as chair to go to the clerk and ask, uh, I don't think we have consensus, to ask, to ask for a recorded division. So, Madam Clerk, please, recorded division. The vote is on a motion from Mr. Fisher to adjourn the meeting. Mr. Baines. Yes. Ms. Lambropoulos. Yes. Mr. Fisher. Yes. Ms. Hefner. In favor. Ms. Khalid. Yes. Mr. Barrett. Voting against the cover up. Mr. Brock. Absolutely no to this ongoing and persistent. Chair, that's yeah. absolutely inappropriate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely yeah, yeah. inappropriate, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chair. You just need a simple yes or no, please. Thank you. Mr. Couric. I vote against. Monsieur Villemur. Monsieur Villemur. Oh. Oh. Okay, Mr. Wilmer appears to be uh, frozen on Zoom. Il a l'air d'être uh, gelé dans Zoom. On va passer au prochain qui est M. Green. Je vote pour. I can try. I don't know if Mr. Wilmer can hear me or not. If not, the... Uh, I, I would prefer that we wait for Mr. Wilmer to reconnect. Uh, it may not make a difference on the vote, but uh, out of respect for Mr. Wilmer. Do you want to suspend on the vote? We will. We don't know because he's he's actually literally frozen on Zoom. So. Clerk on that one because it's. I'm going to suspend for a minute until we get back. With all due respect, Mr. Chair, you can't suspend when a minute if a member is out of the room. It's exactly the same as if he's offline. Well, point I, of order. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, I'm going to consult the clerk on that one because it's the first time I've dealt with anything like that. Mr. Fisher, stand by. Uh, I am back. Mr. Villemur, we're, we were waiting for you for your vote. Madam Clerk? Donc, <laughs> Monsieur Villemur, on va remettre. Monsieur Villemur, we're going to give you the context. The motion was Mr. Fisher's motion to adjourn the meeting. We were, we were voting, and we weren't able to have your vote because you experienced technical difficulties. I vote against. Donc, yes. Six, nays four, we oui, six, no quatre. Okay, so the uh, the motion to adjourn the meeting uh, has been uh, approved, and uh, I have no other obligation as the chair but to uh, adjourn the meeting. Comment, like, and subscribe, and join if you can. You've been served.